Welcome into Four Down Territory, the post Super Bowl edition. I am Kyle Madsen, the managing editor of NinersWire.com. Joining me, as always, Doug Farrar, the managing editor of Touchdown Wire. And Doug, we had a heck of a game last Sunday, man. Yes, we did. I was one of those. I tried in Seattle uh, last night, still a bit bleary eyed, but it was it was quite something. One of those. It was one of those games where I'm a Golden State Warriors fan. Mm-hmm. And during game seven of the 2016 finals, there was a timeout late in the game. And I remember sitting on my couch in my little apartment in Arizona going, this is a good sports moment. Like yeah. whatever happens here, whatever, the resu- even if it's the result I don't want, it's a good sports moment. And that's, uh, that's how the timeout between the fourth quarter and overtime felt yeah. for, for me on Sundays. Pretty remarkable. Glad you got to be there. Hope you had a blast in Vegas. Let's, I did. Uh, we got a lot of work done. We got a lot of cool stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Now I'm ready to sleep for like three days. <laughs> Very me, good. Very good. Draft is like, uh, 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 which is, you know, that's fine. Can't can't sleep just yet. We got one drive to get through with these four downs. Yep. And let's start with uh, with first down as we begin our Super Bowl postmortem. Uh, Kyle Shanahan had perhaps more than anyone more at stake and more to lose in in Super Bowl 58. Uh, and he lost. In the biggest game of the season, uh, for for the second time in in four years, five years I should say, and once again he had a he had a huge lead that he and his team ultimately wound up squandering. What does that say about Shanahan in an overall sense, and where are we where are we with him historically at this point? I think that right now Kyle is kind of the modern day Don Coryell, and it underlines just how cruel these biggest games and biggest moments can be Shanahan has now been the offensive play caller in three Super Bowls, which his team had at least a 10 point lead and blew it. Mm-hmm. Well, that happened against the two greatest organizations of his era, the Bill Belichick Patriots and the Andy Reid chiefs. That's the first part. I mean, sometimes the bear eats you. And every time Kyle gets in the darkest parts of the woods, that's always been the biggest bear uh, staring back at him. Yep. As for Coriel, he was very much like Shanahan. And, and now that He's directly resp- Shanahan's directly responsible for how like half the teams in the NFL play offense. Yeah. Because if, if, with Coriel, if you didn't want the Bill Walsh, Walsh offense back then, the West Coast stuff, you surely wanted your own version of what Coriel was doing with that three digit kind of Sid Gilman stuff. And sometimes it's just the one thing, man. I mean, maybe you have a team owner who is too cheap, cheap to play uh, Fred Dean, who defines your entire defense. And you know Fred Dean because then he went to the 49ers and defined their entire defense. Yeah. Uh, maybe you have to go to Cincinnati to play an NFC championship game in 60 below wind chill, and that neuters your entire offense. Coriel could never get over the hump. It's why it took him much, much, much too long to get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which is mm-hmm. – I could do a whole podcast on how dumb that is. Um, sometimes it was Coriel's fault. Sometimes it wasn't. But the Bear always ate Coriel in, in those crucial moments. And Shanahan is not the first great coach to suffer through this and eventually prevail. Tom Landry couldn't get back past the Packers and Browns in the late 1960s. John Madden's Oakland Raiders lost three AFC championship games in a row, all to the eventual Super Bowl winner, either the Don Shula Dolphins or Chuck Knoll Steelers. Think about all the legacies that have been hindered by Tom Brady and Bill Belichick over the last 25 mm-hmm. years. That's where Shanahan is. As to whether he ever gets out of that box, I don't know, but – as great as he is, and he he to me is the finest offensive mind of his generation. But yep. these moments define you whether you like it or not. Yeah, no doubt. I will say a huge lead at, at 10 points against Andy Reid and, and Patrick Holmes feels like a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> that's that's nitpicking fair. semantics. Entirely they come fair. back, it might as well be a tie, right? With the, with sure. the rate they come back in these games. How, how much do we have to be up by? Is it 28 or yeah? To, to, don't, don't ask Bill O'Brien. So no. I, it, look, look, you're right. Ultimately, like the can't win the big one label is going to be stuck on Kyle Shanahan until he does, mm-hmm. until he gets over that hump. And that is regret- remember, like, by the way, that Andy Reid was that guy for a good, you know, what, 20 years? He yeah, couldn't win for, the big one. And now forever. he's won. Yeah, right. Right. And so there are things that, that Shanahan and the 49ers could have done differently in Sunday's game to change the outcome, for sure. Uh, surely there's some play calls he wants back. There's definitely an overtime coin toss decision that he'd probably want back. Uh, but also, like, Christian McCaffrey's fumble in the first quarter is not on the head coach. Uh, Daryl Luter, the the rookie corner who had the had a punt bounce off of his heel, and then Ray Ray McLeod not falling on the ball and trying to pick it up and make a play, like, that's ultimately, like, that's not on the, the head coach. No. But uh, four runs to ten passes in the third quarter, that's probably something that we can look back on and say that, that Shanahan could have done differently. Um, 
And we could also probably discuss some of the poor execution with blitz pickups uh, mm-hmm. that allowed free runners at the quarterback, namely. I can't believe how much empty they played. Oh my God. It was crazy. And, and then, and then they, they're just looked, I, I think, and again, this is trying to, to put whatever we can on, on Shanahan here. It, it just, there were some, some blitz things that everybody talked about all week with, with the chiefs. Like, man, the Niners need to be ready for these exotic blitzes. They got to be ready for this and that. And there were just, there were enough. It wasn't like all game, but there were enough snaps in, in key spots where the chiefs just looked more prepared than the 49ers. Mm-hmm. And, and that to me comes back to the head coach. But ultimately, as with everything, there's there's nuance here that that requires us to exist in two headspaces at once. In the small picture, Shanahan didn't win the big one. He's now 0-2 in Super Bowls as a head coach, and that means he has not achieved the number one goal of the sport. Flat out, no matter what way you want to slice it, no matter who you want to lay the blame on, he has not won it. And that is, by definition, failure. Especially for this 49ers team that had pushed its chips all all, all in on on this year yeah. and has gotten so close in in four of the last five years, but the big picture says that what uh, what do you what do you think? Twenty five teams. If Kyle Shanahan became available right now, twenty five teams fire their their coach. Oh, yeah, hire him. Yeah, M- maybe more quickly. Right. So so Shanahan since taking over in 2017, the 49ers have been to 57.1 percent of the NFC Championship games and 28.6 percent of the Super Bowls since Shanahan took over as their head coach. That's not bad for a team that won a combined 15 games in the three years prior to his arrival. So what he's done and again, largely with Jimmy Garoppolo and, and Brock Purdy under center, that's really, really impressive. So he's a good coach whose teams haven't been able to make the couple of plays they need to win a Super Bowl. If this becomes a trend trend where the 49ers regularly look unprepared or they regularly start missing the playoffs or they get into there's some trend in Super Bowls or, or playoff games that say, oh, man, that Shanahan just can't figure it out. But for now, I go back to 2019 and I go back to the Super Bowl and there are one or two plays that are, are, are not head coach dependent that that I think if they go differently, the Niners are, are sitting here two and zero in Super Bowls, and we're talking about the the Shanahan dynasty. So, yeah. uh, I I I think he's a good coach who's yet to get over the hump. I don't think the 49ers need to do something dra- tra- uh, drastic like fire him. Yeah. He he just God. he's he, and he might just be running into a into a buzzsaw, and and Reed and and Mahomes are going to turn like the he's running into two. He's running into the two best franchises of the new of the millennium. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that's uh, what do you do? Yeah, maybe they're just maybe they're just the '90s Bills, like maybe that's just gonna or the '60s Cowboys happens. or the '70s Raiders, like I said, or or Andy yeah. Reid for twenty years. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I the the run pass stuff. I mean, the Chiefs were they blitzed a lot. They were. I wrote a piece that one thing I didn't I did not expect them to blitz as much as they played man behind it. They yeah. played eighty one snaps of. All, all season, the Chiefs had 81 uh, opponent attempts of blitz, five or more pass rushers with man coverage behind it. 81 all season. They did 23 times in this game. So Spags was Spags was Dr. Frankenstein, and sometimes you just have to tip your hat. He was the best coach on the field. He had his guys the best prepared to play, and Purdy had an opponent pass rate or pass rating of 137.5 all season with blitz and man coverage. So Mm -hmm. they did the one thing you're not supposed, they did a lot of stuff they weren't supposed to do on defense. The chiefs did like, you don't do this to Brock Purdy or you don't do this to Kyle Shanahan. Spag was like smoking his big cigar one. I'm going to do it anyway. And he did. And it worked. So Purdy was what? 12 of 18 for 131 yards and a touchdown against the boys. He was not the problem. No, before we get into this referendum on Brock Purdy, and I will be writing about this this week. He was not the problem. At all. No, I, I, I very much thought uh, the opposite. That's not what we're here to talk about, though. I know you and I could sit here and talk about this for hours. Let's jump over to second down. You mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about in the in the Kyle Shanahan uh, question in first down. We talked about his his uh, can't win the big one label and how that got put on Andy Reid. Mm-hmm. So after Andy Reid wins his third Super Bowl in the last five years, where are we at? with him because all of a sudden he's not just like a shoe in first ballot hall of famer. Now he is the engineer and mastermind behind one of the true dynasties in pro football history. So uh, uh, Doug, I ask you, where are we at with Andy Reid? Yeah, no question. And it's harder to do now because you have free agency and the salary cap and all that. Um, 
<clears throat> the thing about Reed to me, it's always been this way is his humility. He knows how hard it is to do this at the highest possible level because for a very long time, he was the guy who couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, but he had been studying, like, the whole thing about, oh, he just lucked out with Mahomes. That's such garbage. He had, been up for him. he had been studying spread game comp concepts for a decade before he got yeah. Mahomes. He had the perfect system just waiting for the perfect quarterback. He didn't just luck into it. Before Mahomes, he had consulted with Chris Alt, who invented the pistol formation with Colin Kaepernick at Nevada. He made Brad Childress his spread game coordinator. And everyone laughed at him. They're not laughing now. He had Alex Smith in his Chiefs offense, and Smith had run a lot of spread stuff under Urban Meyer at Utah. Luck is the residue of design. I think it was either Branch Rickey or Benjamin Franklin who said that. I don't remember. But the Reed Mahomes partnership is a perfect example of that old saying. And when Bob Sutton's defense fell apart against the Patriots in the 2018 AFC Championship game, that was another example where it could have gone like, if the Patriots could have extended that a few more years, maybe the Chiefs or their team, like, they can't get over the hump because of Belichick. But Reed had seen enough. He got Steve Spagnuolo off the street, stole him, larcenous. Mm -hmm. And this season it was Spag's defense that got the Chiefs where they ultimately were. I have said before, they would not have made the playoffs without Spags. Forget the Super Bowl. They were not in this. They were not yep. in the tournament. So he's now one of the greatest head coaches of all time. And I think that common thread among these all-timers is the understanding there's always a, a way to get better at what you do. Yep. If you prefer to think that it's my way or the highway, you are hosed because someone's always building a better highway. So for me, it's that Andy has never lost the ability and the willingness to learn. That's what makes you great. And I, I will mention, I talked to a lot of, I did a long feature on Spags last week, talked to a lot of his players. Drew Tranquil, the linebacker, said, the interesting thing about Spags is he will, I mean, he'll put his foot down like this is what we're going to do, but he'll listen to his players. There are a couple of adjustments they made against the Ravens in the AFC Championship game that linebacker Nick Bolton had suggested to him. So it's yeah. the humility that makes you great. It's the understanding that you're always ascending, you're always learning, you're always trying to get better, and you don't, you never have all the answers. So you're always looking yeah. for the next answer. Yeah, I think I think that's that's all spot on. I didn't think anyone, as, as far as Andy Reid goes, I didn't think anyone would ever get into the Bill Belichick conversation in my lifetime. Like right. just what what he and the Patriots did for as long as they did it, it set a standard that I I, 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 frankly, I don't know if if that kind of longevity will ever be reached. And Reid isn't there just yet, but he's certainly trending that direction. And it's hard to envision any year in the next ten or twelve where the Chiefs aren't contending for a Super Bowl. Like there's going to be hiccups because you're not going to go to the Super Bowl every year and you're not going to win it every year. Even as great as the well, Patriots were, they had. <laughs> you know what? You're right. Uh, but but as 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 um as great as the Patriots were, you know they had they had years where they fell short. They went but, ten years without even getting to the Super Bowl in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so maybe maybe there's something like that. But if if the Chiefs and Reed won six or seven titles, like I, what do you what do you set the over under at? Like four and a half. And you probably have uh, yeah. most people taking the over. Yeah. So six or seven is is very much on the table. They're halfway to six, and Mahomes isn't even thirty. I, I just re, it, he's already one of the greatest coaches we we've ever seen. And if he starts stacking up Lombardi trophies, and he gets to six, he gets to seven, and then we start bringing in the totality of his career as a head coach. And you start to appreciate the success that he had in Philly because he had so much success mm -hmm. in Philly, despite the fact he didn't get over the hump and, and win a title there. It When you take in the totality of his career, I, I think that he's going to have a very, very good argument to, to be above above Belichick in the all-time co uh, coach hierarchy. And I didn't think that was even remotely possible. So the fact it's even even on the table is is pretty incredible and a testament to how good of a coach Reed is. Well, we're going to get into this in a minute. Uh, the chiefs are by no means going away. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's well, about to get real scary for the rest of the AFC, but I digress. Well, let's, let's get to that. Let's get to third down because the other greatness discussion that we have to have now is, is about Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Are we now talking about the greatest quarterback we've ever seen with three titles in his first six years as a starter? And if not, how are you arguing against it? Well, the thing about Mahomes this season, it was obstructed a lot by his receivers lining up wrong and running bad routes and dropping the ball a lot, is how he side defenses at another level. 
this season he wasn't just the guy with all the physical gifts and running around, you know, running out of anything and making all these bizarre off-platform throws. Like, hey, didn't he used to play baseball? Yes, he did. So did Matthew Stafford. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, Matthew Stafford and Clayton Kershaw went to high school together. Is the new Jerome Bettis is from Detroit. Um, great quarterbacks aren't always great. They're just great when they need to be. I think John Facenda said that. Well, after 49ers rookie Daryl Luter Jr., as you mentioned, muffed that punt with 242 left in the third quarter, here are Mahomes' numbers from then on. From, this is from Daniel Valenti of The Score. Thank you, Daniel. 17 of 23 for 170 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, 33 rushing yards on four carries. Three of those carries went for first downs. Man. By the way, the 49ers fumbled twice and lost both of them. The Chiefs fumbled five times and lost just one. I'm just saying. That's how the ball bounces, man. Yep. Literally. But Mahomes has the right to put his name up there with any quarterback in pro football history. I have... Very little reason to argue with any of it, except for obviously longevity. Uh, but we talk about the future of Mahomes and the Chiefs. It's now the ways in which he dissects defenses before the snap that will secure him in and quite possibly atop the quarterback pantheon. I mean, there's what what is not to like? What is not there to align with the greatest quarterbacks of all time? You tell me. Is there anything? No, this is the, so. The only had, thing is that he hasn't done it as long as Brady or Manning or you know whoever. Right. So that's where. So that's where I land. Mahomes isn't there yet because there is a degree of of longevity that plays sure. in here, and that that matters in the in the greatness conversation. So I'm not saying that Mahomes is the goat now, but um, he takes the clutch factor that made Tom Brady great. Mm-hmm. And the physical tools that made Dan Marino or pick whatever, you know, physically gifted quarterback you have. And it's hard to envision a road where he doesn't wind up as the greatest quarterback of all time. And so I think when you hear people say, oh, he's the GOAT, they're just projecting out. And they're going, yeah, there's no reason this guy isn't going to win four or five more Super Bowls in his in his time and finish with seven or eight and just be the undisputed greatest quarterback of all time. And it like it makes it makes sense. It, you mentioned the receiving core that that he overcame this year, and he he's now maybe the most talented quarterback we've ever seen, winning with the worst version of his team he's ever had, and finishing his first six seasons with three titles before he turns thirty. Like that is an unbelievable resume that n- nobody has has matched. On top of the fact that it's like impossible to stop the guy. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a there's not he a solution not to die. him down. <laughs> so, dude, it's crazy. So ultimately, greatness is defined by winning, and there's a volume factor here thanks to Brady's years and years of of postseason su- success, and that's just the next step for Mahomes. Yeah, he has to sustain this for the next ten or so years, and if he does that, he could very easily wind up with a resume that eclipses Brady's. And at that point, it would be hard to argue that anyone other than Mahomes is the greatest quarterback to to ever lace him up when you combine what he does physically with all the winning. With all the clutch moments, he is uh, he is he is regardless of where you put him in the all time rankings, uh, when his career is done, he is something special, man. Well, I mean, Brady had years of bad receivers and Jamar Jamar Gaffney's bug eyes in that one championship game. And what did they do in two thousand seven? They loaded up with Randy Moss and Wes Welker. Yeah. So even Brady, who is the goat, needed he needed some guys. Whether it was you know Moss and Welker or uh, Gronkowski and Hernandez, or who I mean, what before he left New England, he was he, they didn't have anyone who could separate, and he wanted yeah. to get out of there, go to Tampa Bay, and you know, won another Super Bowl with some guys who could separate, and that, yeah. that's it's part of the deal. So, I would argue that this season, Mahomes has done, as you said, more with less from a receiver perspective than maybe anyone at this yeah. level. It's incredible, yeah. So, let's move to fourth down and let's spin this forward. Where do both of these teams go from here? <laughs> Well, Kyle, if you're tired of the Chiefs at this point, I have some bad news. Oh boy. <laughs> They're not going away. <laughs> they have almost $16 million in effective cap space per overthecap.com going into the 24 league year. And they would be able to free up a lot more by messing with Mahomes' guaranteed money, you know, there's like salary bonuses and roster bonuses and sure. whatever. Uh, they have a couple of major free agent decisions to make with Chris Jones and LeJarius Sneed, but they'll get at least one of them, if not both. I think they, you know, because they're both, I mean, Chris Jones, to me, got robbed out of his second Super Bowl MVP. It's like Eli Manning and Justin Tuck all over again. 
Um, the Chiefs desperately need at least one downfield receiver. It's interesting when you watch the Super Bowl from the press box, it's like all 22 every play. I don't think there was one play where the Niners, when they went too high, like the safeties were never passed like eight yards from the from the line of scrimmage. No one took the deep threat seriously. And nope. outside of that one Michael, Michael Hardman catch, which Tayshawn Gibson completely busted on, um, they shouldn't have because the, so, and yeah, they need a downfield receiver or two. This receiver class in the draft, any kind of receiver you need, you've got like three or four of them from the first mm. round, not the fifth. It, it is a amazingly stacked and diverse receiver class. So, yeah, they're not going away. Um, Steve Spagnuolo isn't going to get hired away as a head coach, uh, and they might be able to get Eric Bieniemy back. He talked to the team uh, recently, so it's just hit after hit. The 49ers are up against a cap wise. They're about 11.8 million over right now. And the problem is that their biggest cap hits go to their most important players Trent Williams, Debo, Eric or Armstead, Fred Warner, Nick Bosa, McCaffrey, Shervarius Ward, and on and on. Even if they wanted to punt someone like Armstead, there is a lot of cap relief there. They loaded up, as you said, for 2023. And this is what you get when that happens. This is when you have to pay for it. The mm-hmm. good news is that they're falling out of the draft purgatory from the Trey Lance trade. And they have the big brains in the room to rebuild that way. You would like to see them be able to take advantage of the biggest roster win you can possibly have, a franchise quarterback on a ridiculously cheap contract. But for now, it's going to be a challenge just to bring the band back together. Um, And I'll say this. The other thing we don't yet know, and I'm not saying it will happen, but how or if these premium losses will start to affect the team's overall mentality. I watched the Seahawks up close fall apart pretty quickly after Malcolm Butler's interception Mm -hmm. at Super Bowl 49. That was a very mentally strong team, but they were ne- room full of alphas, but they were never the same. And again, I'm not saying it's going to happen to the 49ers, but you have to wonder how much of that they can take before it starts to show. Yeah. Yeah. The So the Chiefs, I'll just start with them. They apparently don't need to do anything because <laughs> the, t- the one just show the, up and win another Super Bowl. Cool. Bro, the, 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 Doug, the, the team that just won the, the Super Bowl is probably the worst Kansas City team we'll see any time in the near future. I have a great and, quote from Nate Tice of the Athletic Football Show. I love Nate. He said he said something like they're the they're the dumbest good team I've ever seen. <laughs> it's true, dude. I it, love it just, that. It's it's spot on. I yeah. also a big Nate Tice fan. Oh, but it, it it's just it, it's silly that this Chiefs team won a won a Super Bowl. They sure. need to figure out the Chris Jones and Legarius need stuff for sure. And I, I'm I'm not totally sure they can be the same defensively without without either of those guys. So they'll they'll also need to provide some better pass catching weapons for Mahomes because doing what he did this year with that group, I just don't think is is sustainable. But beyond that, it's just a matter of letting the Reed Mahomes Bagnolo train roll forward until any one of the trio wants to get off. Like that's yeah. just I, I think that's just kind of the 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 start and end of it for them. And talking uh, the to more- Spags, by the way, this he said, you know, this is the first year I've really had this defense together. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, you could tell. That's terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. So for the 49ers, it's it's definitely more precarious. You mentioned all the cap stuff. They'll have a bunch of rollover cap space thanks to all the restructures they did of their bigger contracts last offseason. Oh, okay. Um, however, they're quietly getting old. And they don't have Brock Purdy under contract for $14 an hour for a lot longer. So not only is it clear that they need to upgrade on on both sides of the line, they need help in the secondary, and they'll need to start figuring out contingency plans for some of their stars. Trent Williams, 36 years old before next season. George Kittle turns 31 next season. Eric Armstead does as well. Javon Hargrave is already 31. He turned 31 just before the Super Bowl. Debo Samuel turned 28 in January. Christian McCaffrey will be 28 in June. Like this is a group of players that doesn't have another five-year window in it. Right. So they have to they have to not only try and thread this needle of bouncing back and competing again after losing a Super Bowl in overtime, a, 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 after losing two consecutive NFC title games, mind you. But now they have to figure out, hey, what does this next three to five years look like when all of these stars either age or or are out of their contracts? So that's and and they have to do all of this after losing Adam Peters, their uh, vice president of football operations and assistant general manager to the Washington commanders. He was at Peters was the Niners number one personnel guy. So now they need to replace him while also going through all these changes roster wise. It's tough. So, oh, the combine is in less than three weeks. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> right. 
So they'll also need to decide. And so much of this that lands on, on Brock's Purdy, on Brock Purdy's shoulders. And they have to figure out just how much he can slash will elevate a roster. He's extension eligible after next season and a free agent after 2025. So do they pay him and sacrifice elsewhere on the roster or do they move on and try to find another inexpensive quarterback while loading up the roster around him? I think it's going to be fascinating to see how that all goes. If Shanahan is right about Purdy and he's a franchise quarterback, then the 49ers should be fine even as they jettison some of their stars because now <coughs> the the bar for the roster around the quarterback isn't as high. However, if Shanahan is wrong about Purdy and he's another Jimmy Garoppolo type where he needs that that stellar roster around him, the 49ers could be in for a disaster over the next few years. So they are a fascinating team to watch, not only this offseason, but but over the next couple. No question. Um, I, I think Purdy can elevate. I I it's I, I got to speak to Eli Manning uh, last Friday for an mm-hmm. event. Um, and actually, Purdy reminds me a lot of Eli. Interesting. Just, it, the way he throws, the way he moves, the way he's able to, you know, get whacked or have a bad game and just throw it off. I mean, yeah. that, that's, you know, he's kind of unconscious that way. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about the Niners, and it, it presents itself in all the high salary guys, the depth is not that great. It's I mean, if you lose it, sorry, Oren Burks, but losing Dre Greenlaw probably lost them the Super Bowl because that was not I, pretty. It was and, really bad. And, uh, both sides, you know, if you're, you got your various ward, but you know, Yamador Lenoir and Amber Thomas, it, it gets a little sketchy. So yeah. they yeah. got great, they got great players, but it's mostly up top and that's dangerous. They, their secondary situation is so bad that in the Super Bowl they started Logan Ryan at the nickel on I know. purpose. I know. Logan Ryan, who was on a cruise on Thanksgiving when the Niners called him. <laughs> Logan was, Ryan, who hasn't played cornerback in like five years, yep. is starting a nickel in the Super Bowl. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm there's as good as the roster was. Like you said, there were a lot of depth problems. Meanwhile, the Chiefs can lose Brian Cook to an injury in Week 14 and get a, a low draft rookie Shamari Connor to come up and make all these big plays. Yeah. See, that's the other thing about the Chiefs, man. They, they're loaded in the, the bottom of the boat. Mm-hmm. And they have two coaches in Reed and Spags who just know how to bring out the best in all these guys. That that's that maybe is the most terrifying part of this dynasty. And it it mm-hmm. you know the, it's common to other dynasties. I mean, how many guys did Belichick elevate and they you know get big money contracts elsewhere? They've you know come running back to New England three years later. I'm tired of sucking. Please get take yeah. me back. Yeah. That's kind of how the Chiefs are. That's another thing. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see the trajectory of both of these teams uh, moving forward for sure. Uh, Doug, this was a super fun season. I yes. look forward to our off-season content here on Four Down Territory. Um, so everybody stay tapped in on the various channels, uh, whether you subscribe to the podcast or you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on social media or you're watching at Touchdown Wire. Thank you for sticking with us throughout this year. We'll have plenty of off-season content coming, coming up for you as we look forward to free agency. We look forward to the draft and beyond. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks, everyone.